Well, good morning, everyone. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Now, Lord and Saviour, thank you for bringing us all together here this morning. Lord, we know you have a purpose in this. We are indeed in awe of you, of your amazing love. And how can it be that you, my God, should die for me? And yet you did. And because of this, we are no longer slaves to sin, but we are now free to worship you and to serve you and enjoy fellowship with each other in the family of God. Lord, please bless our remaining time this morning. Make your word clear to us despite the inadequacies of the speaker. And I pray that we would learn more than just education, that we would live out your word in our lives. We ask these things through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Owen Wister was an old college friend of President Franklin, oh sorry, Theodore Roosevelt. And he was visiting, visiting him at the White House And Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, kept running in and out and in and out and in and out until Wister finally asked if there wasn't something that Roosevelt could do to control her. Well, said the President, I can do one of two things. I can be the President of the United States or I can control Alice, but I can't possibly do both. Well, this morning um, we're going to be looking at the Scriptures to learn from them how we are to raise godly children. Obviously this message is aimed at parents who have children, but if you are a person who doesn't have children this morning, um, you could think this would be a great opportunity to catch up on some sleep. But, uh, you know, um, even if you're not a parent, you do have influence over children. And... uh, you know, you might have nieces and nephews, you might teach in school or Sunday school. Um, but at the very least, there's a lot of children here that look at you and they watch you and they learn from the way you act and behave. So we all have an influence over children. And of course, by going to sleep, that would be a really bad example for the children, don't you think? Children are a gift from God. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Children are a gift from God and the fruit of the womb is a reward. And it's true. For those of us fortunate enough to have been blessed with children, uh, we are indeed privileged. Despite all the mess, the dirty nappies, vomit, sleepless nights when they're young, and then as they grow, all the anxious moments you have is they're maturing, we still count ourselves blessed, more so if our children end up loving and serving our Lord. But to get to that point, there's some work for us to do as parents. The obvious starting point is that when the stork comes along and drops off those little bundles, we need to provide for them the basics of life. Uh, We need to protect them as they're initially incapable of doing either. And left to their own devices, they wouldn't last long at all. So when we start off parenting, we naturally gravitate to the parenting style to which we're accustomed, usually in a similar vein to our parents. Uh, My initial parenting was very much based on the way my father brought me up. Not quite the same, mind you, I determined when I'd grown older that he'd made some mistakes. And I was determined when I had children that I wouldn't repeat them. And I want you to know that I was pretty successful in that. There's a, m- most of the mistakes he made I didn't, but um, I actually did make plenty of my own mistakes, as I'm sure my children can testify. Often we raise our children in a reactive manner. We, um, we allow life to putter along until something goes wrong, and then uh, we attempt to fix it up. A more proactive way would be to have a goal and a plan to train your child towards that goal. This way, they're able to make wise decisions so that they can avoid getting into trouble in the first place. Now, if you've been blessed with children, I've got some news for you. Raising them is your responsibility. Many parents hand over some of that responsibility to government, schools, youth groups, even Sunday school, babysitters, daycare centres, friends or relatives. And some fathers think that they can just leave the children raising to the mothers 
or vice versa. This is often done so that parents are then able to uh, prioritise other activities or a career that they have a passion for. Now, although fathers and mothers are equal in relationship to Christ, the scripture gives specific roles to each in the family. The father is to assume the leadership in the home. The leadership should not be dictatorial like a boss who barks orders. A godly father leads his family by living in such a way that he wins the respect and the trust of his wife and children. Now, fathers, there's three types of relationship you can have with your child. The first one is biological. That means you manage to have a child. The second level of relationship is one of provider and protector. And this is where a lot of fathers do a pretty good job. They manage to earn money, bring home the bacon, and bring, you know, provide the necessities of life for their children and protecting them from uh, you know, threats around them. But the third one is the one that um, Scripture calls us to, and it's one of mutual trust and loyalty. The duty of a godly father is to develop a relationship of trust with his children. He does this because he loves them, and he cares for them, and he naturally wants what's best for them. But this costs time and commitment. I mean, as husbands, you are the leaders, or even the shepherds in your home under God and you bear the ultimate responsibility of training of the training of your children now unlike farmers of today the shepherd referred to in Bible's time he walked in front of his sheep not from behind like we do the sheep learned to trust him and they would follow him the shepherd would protect the sheep and he would lead them to green pastures likewise fathers you are the shepherds in your home and you are to lead your wife and your children in the instruction and admonition of the Lord for their good and your good and ultimately for the glory of God. I like Psalm 23. It gives a great picture of God the shepherd and it's a good model on which to base your fatherhood. Let me read it to you, a part of it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So just imagine you've got a young child looking up at you. Does he see those sort of qualities in you? Are you the father, his shepherd? Are you the one that he or she, I'm using he because I've got to use something. Um, is he the, are you the one as the father that he looks up to and trusts implicitly? I shall not want. Are you the one that provides and protects for your child? He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. Do you provide a stable and secure home for your children? Um, that are free from trouble and maybe domestic conflict. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Do you as a father have a goal to raise your child and draw, to draw them towards righteousness for God's glory? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Even though there's evil and violence around, use your child for you totally safe and have no fear, because you as the father protect them. It actually reminds me when I was about 12, I think, uh, I was living in Carnarvon. We had uh, a rather large cyclone come towards us. We didn't think it was going to be a big deal, but the weather services in those days weren't what they are now. And it turned out to be quite a doozy. And in fact, we got the eye over the town. Um, The first half came through rather quickly, but the second half, well, it came back with a vengeance from the other direction, and it came from the sea. And it drove up the the water. Uh, We were living probably about three metres above sea level. 
and the road was about two metres above sea level and this water came rushing across the mudflats. You could watch it like a little waterfall. Uh, and it came, before we know it, it was up under our house. And our dad gathered us together, took us out through the storm into the car and we drove towards town and uh, the water got deeper on the way, probably up to the bonnet of the old Holden. But good old Holden, she got us through and we got into town and we got into the town hall and we were safe there. But, you know, I don't remember any fear of that because, you know, Dad, he had it under control. He didn't appear worried. He just, very matter-of-factly, organised us and we did it. And I think this is, you know, part of the father's role is to make it so that your children aren't anxious about things going on around them. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Do your protection and direction comfort your children? I think that's a great model for us as fathers. In Deuteronomy 6, we're given the greatest commandment of all. It says, if you want to have a look in verse uh, 7, Deuteronomy 6, 7, 6, 5, sorry, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your sons and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. So there you go, gentlemen, there's your task for life. Mothers, on the other hand, should be taught to love their children. Love requires caring for them, and this is something that can and must be learned. If women who do not learn this will cause God's word to be blasphemed, older women have a part in helping you with this. Let's have a look at Titus 2, verse 3, where Paul is talking about the duties of the older people and the younger people. He says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behaviour, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, why? So that the word of God will not be dishonoured. So here are your responsibilities, mothers, from that verse. Firstly, to learn from the older women. Now, I know older women are old and have old-fashioned ideas and sometimes are not relevant in modern-day thinking. But this is a biblical principle. Older women have brought up children and they have learnt a lot of the principles that the scripture has been teaching them over that time and guess what the principles from scripture they don't change and they they are valid all, th all through eternity so a wise mother will seek to be taught from older godly women women you're to love your husbands now I could preach a sermon on this but I, I'll, I'll control myself today um, also they are to love their children in verse 4, the Greek word is philotechnos, I think if I've pronounced that correctly, it's all Greek to me, appears in reference to mothers loving their children. This word represents a kind of mother's love. The idea that flows out of this word is that of caring for their children, nurturing them, affectionately embracing them, uh, meeting their needs, and tenderly befriending each one as a unique gift from the hand of God. Women are to be sensible, that means responsible, you know, growing up, uh, sober-minded versus foolish or unwise. They are to be pure, clean, blameless and unstained from guilt. They are to be workers in the home and this is where your priority must be. If your working outside the home causes you to neglect your husband, or your children, then it's wrong for you to be working out of the home. You are to be kind and considerate, and you are to be subject to your husband as in the Lord. This is your priority, mothers. Why? 
Well, if you're going to train your children, these are the sort of attributes you'll want to be training them in. And you need to be able to be living that yourself before your children will listen to you. And also you need to be doing that so that the word of God will not be dishonoured from verse 5. Parents, far more is caught than taught. As much as you train your child, it amounts to very little if you don't believe what you're teaching. If you are not living these principles that you are trying to train into your children, you will likely fail. Your children will lose respect for you and they'll see you as a hypocrite, justifiably. Parents cannot lead their children any further than they have gone themselves. Many years ago, there was a young Jewish boy who grew up in Germany. The boy had a profound sense of respect and admiration for his father. His father saw to it that the life of the family revolved around the religious practice, practices of their Jewish faith. And uh, he led them off to the synagogue faithfully. In his teen years, however, the boy's family was forced to move to another town in, in Germany. The town had no synagogue. It only had a Lutheran church. And the life of the community revolved around this Lutheran church. And all the most influential people went there. <coughs> Suddenly, one day, the father announced to his family that they were all going to abandon their Jewish traditions and join the Lutheran church. When the stunned family asked why, his father explained that it would be better for his business if they did this. The boy was bewildered and obviously confused. His deep disappointment soon gave way to anger and a kind of intense bitterness that plagued him throughout his life. Later he left Germany and went to England to study. Each day found him at the British Museum formulating his idea, ideas and writing a book. In that book he introduced a whole new world view and conceived of a movement that was designed to change the world. He described religion as a, the opiate of the masses. He committed the people who followed him to live without God. His ideas became the norm for the governments for almost half the world's population. His name, anyone guess? Hitler. Nope. Karl Marx. Karl Marx, the founder of the communist movement. The history of the 20th century and beyond was significantly affected because this one father who had let his values become distorted. Mothers and fathers, your life example does significantly affect your children's future. Parents, your children are watching you. They are with you morning, noon and night. They are watching you morning, noon and night. They are copying you in both good and bad. They are learning about your failings. There is nothing of value that you can offer them that will have any effect if your life doesn't add up to what you're teaching. For those of you here that are non-parents at this stage, these children are watching you. They listen to what you say and they imitate the things you do. Is your life an example of godliness to them? Now soon enough, your children will start to grow and they will start to be influenced and tempted by some of the sinful ways of the world. When my children were younger, uh, my greatest fear that I had for them was that if their mum and I were taken off the scene for some unfortunate accident or something, who would care for them like we would? Who would love them like we would? Who would train them to be upright and trustworthy men? And who would teach them and guide them towards the Lord Jesus Christ? It was not until I saw that they had put their faith and trust in the Lord that I knew that I no longer had to worry like that. I knew that I could go and that the Lord would provide and protect them in our place and he would lead them in the way everlasting. Now I know we have a very large number of young people here and all too soon they will be start to be buffeted by ungodly influences from the world and the influences will become stronger and stronger the older they get. You need to be preparing them now for that inevitable buffeting that lies ahead. Some of the world's influences on your child are a lot closer than you realise. 
Let's suppose, for instance, that your child's going to school and he has three close friends who continually attempt to persuade your child to accept practices like uh, speaking bad language or obscenities, maybe dabbling in the occult or you know, things like New Age or witchcraft or astrology, things like that. Maybe introducing them to false religions like Islam or Hinduism, Buddhism, reincarnation, or maybe even false Christian prophets. Maybe they're introducing them to your child to a secular worldview and encourage them to look at things like evolution and abortion. Maybe they're expo being exposed to violence, murder and suicide, drug and alcohol abuse. How about sexual promiscuity, things like fornication, adultery, homosexuality, gender fluidity, immodesty. How about rebellion against parents, governments, God and the Bible? Now suppose this was your child and he was spending hours every day with these three friends and listening to them justify these ideas. Would you be in some way trying to discourage this friendship with these three friends? And yet many children today have three th these three friends who are just like the ones we described. These friends have names. They're called television, movies and music. Television and the internet is where you invite these people into your own home to often negatively influence not only your children but yourself. And not only are your school-aged children affected by television but even younger infants. Philippians 4.8 helps to us to direct our focus. It says, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. Now, I met someone many years ago, I can't remember who now, they were a school teacher, a married school teacher, and they had actually printed out this verse and they had pasted it as with sticky tape on the front of their TV set. And any time they wanted to watch TV, they'd have to put this over the top and then bring it back when they'd finished. And I think that's a, a very good verse to have somewhere around your TV. Um, or maybe good wallpaper to put on your computer or your tablet or even your phone. When your child gets a bit older and gets in maybe into upper school, they're exposed to things like lying and profanity, violence, immodesty, alcohol, bullying, gossip and, gossip and slander, cheating, Stealing, vandalism, disrespect for teachers, parents and authority, false goals like popularity and wealth. Their classes justify things like evolution, abortion, homosexuality, situational ethics, contraception, divorce, premarital sex, disrespect for parents. They have assignments that, uh, reading assignments that involve immorality and violence and other anti-God material. And of course they're exposed to sexual promiscuity. Now you can't be with your kids 24-7 and as they get older you won't have authority over them in any case. Your task is to train them and lead them to the Saviour before time so that they know how to think rightly and they know how to make these decisions without you being there. There are four phases, really, to parenting. From birth to five, this is the discipline phase. Now, a lot of you are in this stage and you know all about that. Um, this is about all you do at this point in time, you just discipline. But from about six to 12, this turns into a more of a training phase. This is where you can speak into your child's life and train them. Now, mind you, some of the um, discipline is still happening, but you've, that's sort of being phased out over this time. From 13 to 19, this is the coaching phase. You understand now, parents, you have no authority over your kids, or little. They won't listen to you now, or they don't have to anyway. Uh, they're growing up, they're thinking for themselves, and they're making decisions on their own part. So your role now is really one of coach. They're in life's battle, they're walking the way, and you're on the sidelines, 
handing over the reins bit by bit as they take on more and more, and you coach them. Of course, this only really works if you've already built up a relationship of trust with them in the years previous. And then the final stage is when they grow into adults. Now, they're still your children, but you enter into a great new phase of mutual respect and friendship as adults. So when your children are at the height of worldly influence and temptation, you can only count on relationships that you've developed with them all their lives. You can only coach them with the principles that you've been teaching them all their lives. When they're in their teens, it's a bit late to start teaching the biblical principle and developing relationship. Now, not that it can't happen, but that's, that's a lot harder act. So this is why this is the time for you to be involved in the training of your children as soon as possible. Now, when it comes to training your children, many parents are tempted to listen to um, accepted authorities on the matter, like psychologists and sociologists, government officials, social agencies, teachers, university professors, and child-raising experts. We often just raise our children the way our parents raised us. This may be done knowingly, but often it's done without thinking. We naturally treat our children in ways that we're familiar with, and we act the way we've seen our parents act. This amounts to accepting our own parents as the best authority to raise children. Now notice that all these are human authorities. Human wisdom is fallible. So it's reasonable to expect that some of their theories may not be good or right. And this is especially true if your goal is to raise godly children. Now if you've been here for the last few months, you know we're looking at Isaiah and we've been constantly reminded that we should not trust in man, but to trust in God in everything. You know Judah has been trying to make deals with its neighbours and refusing to trust in God for its security. And even when counselled by the prophet, they still reject God. They were trying to do a deal with the enemy. Did that work? No, it didn't. In fact, God judged them and they constantly suffered for not turning to God and putting their, own, and putting their trust in their own wisdom instead. The principle of trusting God in everything also applies to our parenting. Where do you get your advice and instructions from when it comes to raising your children? Where do you turn to advice for raising your children? And while there may be a little truth in some secular advice, the only absolute authority is God himself. And he has provided instructions for us in his word, the Bible. So what do you want for your children? It's, often, it's important that you think through your basic objectives as your parents. What's your end goal? What's the game plan? What kind of adult do you want your kid to become? Now, I know a lot of us would say things like, well, we want a well-balanced person, uh, maybe someone who's obedient and respectful to authority. It's always good. Uh, you want to develop and maintain healthy relationships and have respect for other people. You want to be responsible, generous. Good stewards of time and talent and money. They're important. Ultimately, you want them to put their faith in Christ and you want them to develop their spiritual gifts in service to our Lord. So what is God's goal for us as parents? Let's have a look at uh, a few verses. One from Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go and, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Bring up your children in the training and the admonition of the Lord. Genesis 18, 9, Abraham commanded his children to keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice. This should be the goal of all parents who are truly faithful to God. In Psalm 34, 11, it says, Come, you children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Now, for us to accomplish this, we must give our children many things that money can't buy, things like time and love and instruction and advice from God's word. Guidance in dealing with life's problems. You need to set an example of godliness in your own life and you need to be training in moral purity. In Joshua 24, 15, Joshua declared, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
this used to be a sign on my grandmother's wall. It was a stuck up there. And in fact, it wasn't just my grandmother. A, a number of people that I knew when I was growing up had this sign on their wall. And I think this is a goal that we should constantly keep before us. Our children are not given to us to do with as we please. They're not our property. They are God's children given to our care so that we can raise him to be what God wants him to be. One of the greatest things you can do for your child is to help them to develop wisdom. Psychologists theorise that wisdom involves the integration of knowledge, understanding and experience. But they also note that while it can only be acquired through experience, in fact, experience does not automatically confer wisdom. Solomon, the wisest man out of his time, said in Proverbs 2.6, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So God is the author of all wisdom. Any other wisdom is foolishness. So where do you expect to get knowledge and understanding from? Well, the knowledge obviously comes from the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. Now just looking at that, I'm thinking, wow, that's what we're trying to do with our children, isn't it? We want to teach them. We need to reprove them, correct them, and train them in righteousness so, that them, so they may grow up to be adequate and equipped for every good work. Awesome. The understanding is given by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. So it's the Spirit that gives us understanding of God's Word. Raising a child to be wise means that it begins with the Bible. Teaching children the truth from Scripture will make them wise for salvation, 2 Timothy 3.15, and thoroughly equip them to do good works, 2 Timothy 3.17, and prepare them to withstand the onslaught of culture's bent on indoctrinating young people with secular ideology. Now, the opposite word for wisdom is foolishness or folly. Foolishness is like embarking on a course of action that you just cannot win. The ultimate fool, of course, is the one who takes on his own creator, the creator of the universe, the one who denies him or actively stands against him. This is a futile fight which you cannot possibly win. This person is a fool. And he is led by the ultimate fool, which is Satan himself. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Parents, don't be responsible for your child's foolishness. Teach them from the scriptures. Raising a godly child has a lot to do with the principle of sowing and reaping. <coughs> do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, this will he also reap. Uh, some years back... The the city of Houston, Texas, developed an ad campaign in an attempt to deter juvenile crime. As part of that, the Houston Police Department distributed a thing called the 12 Rules of Raising Juvenile Delinquent Children. They are, number one, begin with infancy and give the child everything he wants. In this way, he will grow up to believe the world owes him a living. Two, when he picks up bad words, laugh at him. This will make him think that he's cute. Three, never give him any spiritual training. Just wait until he's about 21 and let him decide for himself. Four, avoid the use of the word wrong, as it may develop a guilt complex. This will condition him to behave later when he's arrested for stealing a car. The society is against him and he's being persecuted. Five, pick up everything he leaves lying around and do everything for him so that he will be experienced 
in throwing all responsibilities onto other people. Six, let him read printed matter, any printed matter that he can get his hands on, which today might be equivalent to giving him free access to the internet. Be careful, mind you, that the silverware and drinking glasses are clean, but let his mind feast on garbage. Seven, quarrel frequently in the presence of your children. This way they won't be so shocked when the family finally falls apart. Eight, give the child all the spending money he, he wants. Never make him earn his own. Nine, satisfy his every craving for food, drink and comfort and see that every essential desire is gratified. Ten, take on Take his side against neighbours and teachers and policemen. They're all prejudiced against your child, you know. Eleven, when he gets into real trouble, apologise to yourself by explaining, I could never do anything with him anyway. And number twelve, prepare for a life of grief, because you'll definitely have it. It's not enough to, to teach your child to obey biblical principles. You want your child to be obedient, sure. But obedient, obedience in and of itself is not the end goal. Compliance is not enough. You want to train the heart of your child so that they can think right. They think the right things for themselves, not just the things you've taught them. You want to, when you ask your child to say sorry, you don't just want to hear the word sorry. You want to see a heart of repentance. When I was uh, a child in Sunday school, <coughs> it was very common to have people in the society, non-Christian people, send their kids to Sunday school. Not so anymore, but it was very common back then. A lot of kids went to Sunday school. Why is this? Why do the parents send their kids to a church when they don't go themselves? Well, of course, they know they want their kids to grow up to be upright, stand, upstanding citizens. They want them to have principles about otherness and about selflessness and about caring and all these sort of good principles. So they send their kids off to church to learn that stuff. And they're the same godly principles we teach our children, but our goal is more than that. Our goal is to have them put their faith and hope in Jesus Christ as their saviour. So how do you measure success? What is success for you? Let's say your child grows up, is a good, good citizen, marries, has a good job, good provider, upright standing citizen. <coughs> or maybe your child's the, a different sort. Maybe they grow up but never get to uni. Uh, they might live in a working class suburb and they're not particularly gifted or even that outwardly attractive. But they serve God faithfully. Which one would you like to be your child? So how do you raise a godly child? Here's four simple steps. You train them not only to do right, but also to think right. This is wisdom. To think right from the heart with principles and precepts that have been taught to them from God through his word, and you do that with great love and compassion. Secondly, you yourself continue to be teachable from the word so that your lives are one in which your children would want to emulate. Three, then you get on your knees and you pray and you pray and you keep on praying and you pray that the Lord will save their souls. Four, if at this time they are not yet putting their faith in Christ, you go back to step three and you pray, and you pray some more, and you keep doing that. Now let me just finish quickly by just addressing maybe some of you here have older children who are unsaved at this time, they're not walking with the Lord. It's a little late to start trying to teach biblical principles like you would an infant, but it's never too late for you to lead them to Christ. But often this starts with you, you the parents, not them. You can no longer make them do or be anything. You can only lead them to Christ by your life's example. 
Is your life before God what it should be? Have you made mistakes in parenting? If so, confess these to the Lord and ask his forgiveness and petition him to help you make the changes to your life that are needed. And then go to your children and ask them to forgive you for your parenting failures. Then go back to step three and pray and pray some more. This is um, part one of a two-part series. Next week, we'll get to where the rubber hits the road and we'll look at things like teaching obedience, discipline and chastisement, happiness versus holiness, repentance, forgiveness and restoration. We'll look at a child's secret world and why my child is different from everyone else's. And we'll also look at six areas of respect. Let's just close in prayer. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of children that you have blessed us with. Give us the understanding to be able to teach your wisdom to our children. These are the very same things that you are teaching us. Give us the power to live our lives in a godly way that our children and others will respect and want to emulate and so be drawn closer to the cross. Help us to be humble, teachable and transparent in our parenting and to bring all our concerns to you in prayer. We ask these things through Christ. Amen.